Hi, everyone. Welcome. Madeline. Welcome, welcome. Hi, everybody. Hey, Jackie. It's good to see you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Elaine. Hey. Hey, Liz. Hi. What's up, Beth? Hello, hello. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. We are a group of wonderfully busy and caring people. So in that spirit, we're gonna go ahead and get started, even though some people may be joining us um, in the next few minutes. And just wanna say welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I am uh, Reverend Amanda, one of the executive ministers at Middle Church. I use she, her pronouns, and on behalf of um, Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, our senior minister, who's also here, who you're going to hear from in a little bit, and all of Middle Church, just thank you so much for spending um, an hour with us tonight. We will mm -hmm. commit to only going an hour, so if you can commit to that with us, that would be wonderful, um, mm -hmm. especially as we are marking the year anniversary of the COVID lockdown in these United States. This conversation is so timely and so important. Um, a brief word about uh, these conversations. At Middle Church, we have Freedom Labs in the spirit of the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer. Um, and the Freedom Schools during that summer were established to supplement the inferior educational opportunities um, provided to young Black people in the state's public schools. So in that spirit, we hold conversations and events from time to time. And we're, again, so glad to be together tonight for a conversation on the COVID-19 vaccine and, of course, its interconnectedness to both race and public health. Uh, we want to have a big section at the end of tonight for um, Q&A, so save the questions that you have. Uh, you can write them down, put them in the chat, whatever you'd like to do, but, we, but this conversation tonight is about you. And a brief word also that we are entering into this space with curiosity. Um, there's, this is a no shame space, so the questions that you have are welcome here. And um, we are gathered tonight in that spirit of curiosity and the desire to take care of the most people that we can. Um, and right now, it looks like having this conversation. So um, without further ado, it looks like we have been joined by the senior minister of Fort Washington Collegiate Church, the Reverend Damaris Whitaker. Hi, Damaris, with the palm tree. Hi, that's just so we can get inspired. I love it. Uh, Damaris, we would be so honored if you would just kick us off tonight with a little bit of uh, moral framing. Absolutely. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and taking time during this uh, Thursday afternoon or evening uh, after being perhaps on Zoom uh, for most of your days uh, to be with us. And thank you uh, to uh, Dr. Jackie Lewis and uh, Reverend Amanda for this invitation. Uh, I'm so, so honored and humbled by, by this invitation tonight. So um, let us take a deep breath together. It's been a day of running and for me a day of working and teaching most of the day. Um, but tonight, um, we are going to talk about uh, this question of COVID and vaccines and, and what does that mean, at least for communities of color, like um, my community in, in northern Manhattan. As you know, in the city of New York, uh, the, you know, the Washington Heights community at many, many points during this pandemic was categorized as one of the um, communities that had the highest uh, incidents of COVID-19. Um, when you look at the map of vaccinations, our community still has a vacuum of places where most people can go and get vaccinated. Uh, we know by all the data and that we, are, we have access to that people of color have suffered uh, the most during this pandemic. When we look at the folks that uh, bring us uh, our wonderful 
organic meals uh, to our buildings and leave them with our doorman. And, and um, those are people of color who are continuing to serve us even during this pandemic. When we look at the people that have to get up every day and work and, and at the beginning of the, this, this pandemic being jammed up in trains in the city of New York, those were people of color uh, who were in the front lines. And yet, you know, right now access of this vaccine is, is difficult. And at this moment, you know, one of the questions that were posed for me was, you know, are you gonna get vaccinated? And, and the answer to that is yes, I am. And, and I hope that I can record that moment and, and just socialize it for our community in Northern Manhattan to see that this black Puerto Rican woman is getting a vaccine. Uh, for us, it's a, it's a call to love ourselves and to love our neighbor. Uh, it's a call to love our community. For us is at this moment, um, our commitment, uh, an act that really, um, really demonstrates our commitment to, to the love of God in the world, uh, to get this vaccine if we can get it, so that we can protect um, ourselves and, and those who are around us. And so, you know, those of us that have certain access to certain things, I want you to remember that our lifestyles are often are often being brought to us uh, through the sacrifice of so many people who we do not see, and but are are from very marginalized communities that are underserved and perhaps are not even. Um, are even living in fear, let's talk about immigration, right? People who are living in fear of coming or going anywhere to get a vaccine because of their immigration status. So um, we are at a moment where our prophetic voice is needed and particularly at a moment where people of faith need to really live into what it means to exercise this love of neighbor uh, and love of children and love of community. So I'm gonna stop there because I don't wanna go over my time. Thank you, Amanda. It's been a year and we still do that. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Whitaker for being with us tonight and for your prophetic and moral witness to this conversation. I wanna pass it over now to Dr. Megan Kirksky and um, Megan will tell you more about um, herself, but I do wanna let you know that Megan is a critical care doctor and anesthesiologist at the Hospital for Special Surgery. And she's been involved in the front lines and the COVID ICU care, and also has a PhD in microbiology and immunology. So Megan, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Oh, and Megan's also a fabulous Middle Church member, I would like to say. I was just going to say that's the most important part, Amanda. <laughs> I'm a, a very a happy member of Middle Church. Um, I am going to try to go as quickly as I can. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, how the vaccines were developed, the vaccines that are available now, how they work, um, some of the concerns about how efficacious they are, how effective they are, and uh, some safety concerns, and a few common questions. And But like we said earlier, we really want to have a lot of time at the end for Q&A, so I'm going to make it as brief as possible, and we can come back to any points later or any other questions that you all have. Um, thank you, Damaris, for that great introduction. Uh, I think a lot of us are aware of the increased burden of COVID-19 in minority communities. And I'm really glad that you all today are going to be talking about access to the vaccine as well. That's something that we don't um, always talk about, but is a major concern. Like you mentioned, there's a much higher rate of exposure for COVID in minority communities. Uh, we have a disproportionate number of essential workers, people who don't have the option of working from home. Uh, we have also a higher burden because we're more likely to live in population dense areas and multi-generational households. And it's just a lot harder to, uh, to protect ourselves in that context. And then you add on that uh, limited access to medical care, a higher burden of comorbidities. And we end up in a situation where mortality rates are two to three times higher uh, with COVID in minority communities. 
Now that we've had this kind of miraculous, almost seemingly miraculous uh, development of a vaccine on such a short time scale and uh, deployment across the country, there are two issues that we're dealing with. And one is uh, access to the vaccine and two is information, uh, getting good information to people about the vaccine and why we should consider taking it. Um, in minority communities in this country and around the world, there has been a history of unethical experimentation in minority communities that gives people reasonable pause. There's been unequal access to quality and cutting edge medical care like uh, these vaccines. And there have also been concerns related to inadequate representation of minorities in clinical trials uh, where the safety and effectiveness of these kinds of treatments um, are assessed. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to share my screen for a second for a little while. And if I can remember how to work PowerPoint, we are going to view my slideshow. Okay. So I'm going to start uh, by talking. I talked a little bit about what race has to do with it. And then I'm going to talk about how uh, the vaccines were made and how they work, how safe they are, and some common questions. One of the things that you may not be aware of is uh, the degree to which minorities have been involved in the development of this vaccine. Some of you may have seen uh, Kismikia Corbett uh, featured in the news. This is a picture from the spring when she was with uh, Dr. Fauci and a some other people who shall remain nameless. Um, and they were discussing what uh, the early developmental stages of this vaccine. And Kismika Corbett actually is a graduate of um, the same undergraduate program. We both went to UMBC. I may be a little biased in their favor, uh, full disclosure. But she had been working for quite a while on co coronavirus research and coronavirus vaccines. And she's been putting herself out there a lot in the community because she said, and I quote here, that she felt like it was necessary to be seen and to not be a hidden figure in this work. She wanted people to know that younger scientists and people of color have been working behind the scenes and she's not the only one who's been doing this work. Um, she wanted to know that there are those of us who have been at the forefront of developing uh, this vaccine and that we stand by the work that we've been doing. In the subsequent slide, you're going to see uh, actually Dr. Freeman Rabowski, who is the president of our university, and he was one of uh, the participants in the Moderna trials, and he spoke out a lot in the media as well. Because, like I mentioned before, it's important that we have representation at, at every stage of the process, and that includes the testing of these vaccines to make sure that they are safe and effective in all populations. And this hasn't always been done in the past. Um, and what we can say, the good news is that specifically for the uh, RNA vaccines, the, both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, people were very conscious early on of the need to test these vaccines in all populations to make sure that they were effective. And we're able to get good representation across the board. Um, approximately 20% of study participants were Latinx, about 10% uh, Black or African American, 4% um, Asian, and uh, there was even reasonable representation of Native American groups who have been um, also very severely afflicted by COVID-19. I'm going to talk very briefly about the science. I hope this doesn't scare anyone away. Um, but I want to show you, for those of you who may not be aware, the coronavirus is, uh, is shaped like a circle. It's a sphere, and it's covered in these spike proteins that I'm sure you've all heard about. And the spike proteins are what allow the virus to bind to cells and to get into the cell and cause disease. RNA vaccines, like I mentioned before, have been in development for a while for Pfizer and Moderna for other uh, viruses. So when COVID-19 came onto the scene, they very quickly repurposed the technology and they were able to take what's called the mRNA sequence. And this is just basically a little uh, instruction guide that the virus has about how to make the spike protein that's on the surface of the virus. So they can take this instruction package, this mRNA, and package it into a little sphere of lipids or little fatty molecules. And these are little microscopic fatty molecules that have this instruction book inside. And they put it into a bottle. And this is the mRNA vaccine that's injected into the muscle when you get vaccinated. These little information packets, um, that are surrounded by lipid are able to bind to the lipid outer layer of the cell. 
of your cells in your body, and they release the little information packet into the cell. This RNA is a very fragile molecule. It's something that can break down very easily and does break down very quickly in the cell. And this is why these RNA vaccines have to be um, frozen at very low temperatures because they don't last very long and they don't integrate into your DNA. They don't alter your cell, but they do uh, stay stable just long enough to tell your cell how to make these little spike proteins. So your cells start to make these spike proteins, release these spike proteins into the body and your immune system recognize them, recognizes them as foreign material, generates antibodies that um, would then attack these proteins if they're seen again. So if you are exposed to the virus after being vaccinated, your body will see the spike proteins that are on the virus. They'll recognize them as this foreign material that they've seen before and they're able to mount a very rapid immune response and clear the virus from the body very quickly um, ideally before it can cause any significant disease. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, that was just approved is similar, uh, except that it uses a viral vector. It uses an adenovirus that's been uh, modified and deactivated. So this adenovirus um, that can't replicate itself, it can't cause disease, takes uh, this little DNA package that also codes for the spike protein and it brings, binds to the cell, brings it into the cell. The cell takes that little DNA into the nucleus where it makes an mRNA very similar to the mRNA vaccines. And the whole, uh, the same process goes on from there. The mRNA is used to make spike protein. The immune response learns to recognize that spike protein so that it can attack the virus when you're, if or when you're exposed. So how well do these vaccines work? The Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are about 90 to 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. So that's any uh, kind of infection that would cause symptoms from a sore throat and a runny nose to severe disease that would cause hospitalization or potentially even death. So these are phenomenally effective vaccines. And the goal when we were first developing vaccines was about 60% uh, efficacy was going to be considered uh, effective. So these have far outperformed anything that we uh, would have reasonably hoped for. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine looked at a slightly different outcome. They looked at moderate to severe COVID and found it to be 72% uh, percent effective in pre preventing moderate to severe disease and 85% effective in preventing severe COVID. In the Johnson & Johnson trial, uh, with this single shot vaccine, uh, it was 100% protective in the trial uh, for preventing death. So all of these vaccines, and this is probably the most important point for any individual considering getting vaccinated, all of these vaccines dramatically de decrease the risk of hospitalization or death from coronavirus um, and from COVID. When you're considering the safety and the side effects, um, we now know at this point about 65 million people in the United States have been vaccinated so far, primarily with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And there have been no major safety concerns identified in the general population. One thing you may have heard about is anaphylaxis and anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction that can happen from anything, uh, peanuts or a food allergy to a medication or a vaccine. The Pfizer uh, vaccine seems to be causing about, uh, I'm sorry, this should be 11 cases per million doses, that's a typo. And the Moderna vaccine causes about 2.5 cases of anaphylaxis per million doses. And this is why they encourage an observation period after you get vaccinated. So in these very, very rare cases where someone does have a severe allergic reaction, it can be uh, quickly treated. There are currently studies ongoing in, for to assess safety in children and pregnant and breastfeeding women. Uh, these are considered vulner vulnerable groups and were not studied in the initial trials. But so far there are no signals uh, of concern in these populations either. Particularly pregnant and breastfeeding women have been uh, vaccinated since the approval of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in this country. But they're continuing to study this. Uh, the common side effects that you do see after the vaccine are uh, soreness at the injection site, and flu-like symptoms can happen, and it's usually in the first 24 to 48 hours. And most people say that it's a very abrupt onset. Uh, fever, fatigue, muscle pain, uh, chills can happen. And then when they do happen, it usually also seems to turn off almost like a switch. People will say, I, you know, I fell asleep, I woke up and felt completely normal again. Um, headache is another common side effect. 
these side effects are more common with the second shot uh, with the RNA vaccines and uh, more common with the Moderna second shot than with the Pfizer. Some common questions that people have, uh, can you still spread the virus after vaccination? This is still being studied, uh, but because some people do develop uh, mild coronavirus after vaccination or asymptomatically will test positive, it is still theoretically possible that one can spread the virus after being vaccinated. So on a personal level, you can feel quite safe that it's extremely unlikely uh, that you will be developing severe disease after being exposed to COVID, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be uh, prevented from spreading it to your loved ones who are not vaccinated. People wonder if they should get the vaccine if they've already had COVID. Uh, because New York was hit very early on, we can definitely say that people who've had the virus, um, the immunity isn't necessarily enduring long-term and people are getting reinfected who were infected early on. The most recent guidelines I've seen suggest um, that if you were infected more than three months ago, you should strongly consider getting vaccinated to boost your immune response and protect you from reinfection. Uh, speaking of reinfection, people are asking a lot about how effective the vaccines are for protecting against the variants. Uh, there's still a lot of data incoming, but it appears that the vaccines are very effective in preventing infection with the British variants. And even uh, with the South African and the Brazilian variants, they seem to prevent uh, severe disease and death, uh, if not preventing infection altogether. Uh, and the other two questions I will leave for a Q&A if anyone else wants to discuss them. I'm gonna stop sharing here and we can move on. Thank you. Should I just carry on? Yeah, go ahead. I was thinking, can I give you a, a little brief intro? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. We're so, so grateful that Dr. Mary Bassett is also with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Bassett is currently in Boston, but is the former New York City Health Commissioner and has dedicated her life to advancing health equity. So um, thank thanks, you. Dr. Thanks Bassett. very much. Thank and I, I first, uh, first want to say how pleased I am to be able to join you this evening and, um, and, and talk to the people of, of Middle Church. And uh, Dr. Kirksey has given us such a great summary that I, I don't really have much technical to add to it. I do want to acknowledge that among the people watching are Matlin Gilman, who I might still be a member <laughs> of Middle Church, who introduced me to all of you, and Alejandra Salemi, who is at the Divinity School at Harvard. So I also noticed that there's some senior, look, senior looking Kirksey's there. I don't know if they're related. Um, but uh, that was a really brilliant summary, <laughs> and I, we want to clap for your daughter if that's who. <laughs> um, that was a brilliant summary, and I, I just want to make a sort of conceptual point that um, that the reason that we're seeing these enormous disparities in the risk of getting infected with this new virus, getting sick from it, and, or and or dying of it by racial ethnic group um, is, is not because we're biologically different. Uh, it's because of what it means to be a, a person of color in our society. And it reflects the structural factors that Dr. Kirksey has outlined so well. It's, it says who, where, what kind of job you're likely to have, what your level of educational attainment has been, where you live, uh, whether you have a low wage job that you can't afford not to go to, uh, something like 40% of the US workforce was labeled essential uh, uh, from the early days of, of the shutdown. So that meant that either you uh, went to work or you didn't get paid. Uh, so people who faced that choice, uh, needing to feed their families, pay the rent, uh, were, were people who've been marginalized and excluded. Uh, not people who were reckless uh, and, uh, or foolish uh, or ignorant. And uh, the usual arguments that come out to explain these differences typically um, invoke problems with people. 
So the initial discussion of these racial ethnic disparities by top people, people I really like and respect, people like Dr. Fauci, who we've all come to feel reassured by and happy he's still continuing to speak to us said, it's because they have all these other diseases and they're so sick and then when they get COVID they die. Uh, but that was really not the driver. The driver was exposure as Dr. Kirksey is, in other words, the risk that you got infected in the first place. And then of course, the risk that you uh, would get sicker uh, because you were obese or had diabetes or heart disease, those are not just bad luck either. Um, they're also related to the structure of our, of our society and the level of medical care. In many ways, poorly managed disease is a reflection of the failure of our, um, of our healthcare system to cover everybody. We still have millions of people who lack health insurance and therefore don't keep their appointments or can't pay for their prescriptions um, and so on. And this also has sort of come up in the vaccination conversation uh, where the kind of go-to explanation is the mistrust argument. Not that there's not a, a, a really good reason for people to be um, untrusting. In fact, um, the young uh, um, scientist, Kezi, I've forgotten her last name, Dr. Kirksey. Corbett, yeah. yeah. Kezi Corbett uh, said, you know, we need institutions to be trustworthy before we start talking about, that's what she said, the scientists, uh, before we start talking about people, um, you know, being untrusting. Uh, but a really big problem, which um, uh, Damaris Whitaker mentioned, and I grew up in Upper Manhattan, um, was the, uh, is the lack of access. I mean, members of my family have told me getting up at three in the morning, getting on multiple websites, navigating these websites, showing up at a place that was doing vaccines in Washington Heights and finding nobody there who speaks English and the place flooded with people from New Jersey and Westchester uh, who didn't live in the neighborhood. These are real access problems. So before we start saying these are stubborn people who don't, you know, don't, don't want to trust us. Let's make sure that there's access first. And the last thing um, that, so I, I just think we should be careful and uh, about that. And I, I know that many black physicians have been called upon to be the face of um, of expertise for the black community, uh, the Latinx community, and say, trust us, get the vaccine. Uh, but let's think about how easy it is to get the vaccine. Uh, and and uh, that remains a, a really big problem. And I don't hear people talking enough about it. The last thing, of course, is that these are really good vaccines. And uh, we don't really, we don't uh, get vaccines that are this effective that often. And uh, they will help us control the, the variants. Uh, the reason that we get these, these strains emerging is because viruses like to find humans to infect and they get more and more effective at it as they multiply in human bodies. So the best strategy for reducing the risk of all these variants that we've heard about, one from the UK, one from South Africa, uh, there's even been one from California, one from Brazil, some of them looking very worrisome, frankly. Um, the best way to protect against that is to lower transmission. Uh, so I, uh, I think that really the best way we can use the time remaining is for everybody to ask every question that somebody asked them that they don't really think they, they know how to answer. Uh, the best person, the person we all listen to uh, for advice are members of our family, people who are our neighbors, who we've known for a long time. Word of mouth is the best source of, of trusted information, actually. And so I want all of you to feel like you know enough to be a trusted source. Thank you so much, both of you. Jackie, do you want to move to Q&A or do you want to talk before we do Q&A and close this out? What do you think? I really want to move to Q&A, but, but if I could take one sentence though. Yes. 
<clears throat> that's why I love what Dr. Bassett just said about us being the trusted source for our friends and our families and our neighbors, which, which makes me also want to say, and we could accidentally traffic in untruth. You know, the, the articles that are being written right now that feel like they want to make a case where the Black people don't want to go get a shot because Tuskegee experiment, you know, you know, Harry Anna Lacks, blah, 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 blah. So when you read that, just listening to these two physicians now talk to us about how the sort of pre-existing conditions are about poverty, are about access, are about story, right, are about history, are about where people live. I mean, my husband went out to the Bronx to get a shot. It was a nightmare. It was a four-hour wait nightmare. On the other hand, right here at the Javits Center, he walked through in 40 minutes. This is the difference between where people live, what they have access to. So I don't want us to be accidentally populating the world <laughs> with stories that don't make sense. So I want you to be, I want us to listen carefully to the answers to the questions and share truth with our families and our friends and not um, buy into the stereotypes that continue to populate the polls, populate the articles, et cetera. Does that make sense? Um, it's, it's like Ubuntu, I wanna say. Wait, we are a village. I am because I am because Megan is. I am because Mary is. You are because you know Kelly is. Can we together change the story that encourages not only the right outcomes about this virus, but ultimately the right outcomes about our culture and our society to make anti-racism a spiritual practice? I could say more. I will not. Y'all didn't know you're coming to church too. <laughs> Come on. So thank that, you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Let's go to Q and A. Dr. Lewis, thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to read uh, from the first one that I saw from uh, Tammy B. Um, have there been any longer term testing and monitoring prior to the vaccine being officially approved and administered to the general public when we knew about it? So, yeah. the, do you want to start, Mary? No, no, I mean, I could, but you go first. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Please go. Uh, Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so the the trials themselves uh, were conducted over uh, a period of less than a year. I mean, the virus clearly has been around for, um, to our knowledge, <laughs> for a little over a year. Um, so by the time the the technology for the mRNA vaccines has been tested over many years, over at least a decade. Um, and that's animal testing, that's uh, in vitro testing and uh, test trials that had begun in humans for mRNA vaccines against other viruses. But these were viruses, the, the urgency wasn't the same, the resources weren't the same, and these were um, kind of slower rollouts. But in none of these early uh, mRNA vaccine studies and adenovirus uh, vaccine studies, for other viruses, were there any major red flags for um, safety concerns? The when these vaccine platforms were repurposed for coronavirus, obviously we're on a much shorter time scale, uh, but a much larger population of people being tested. So we had data when the the data for the approvals was uh, following um, study participants up for about three to six months of follow-up from the vaccine. Now, those people who were in the trials at the time, um, the time since they were approved, you can add tack on another few months of follow-up for those patients. But none of the people who have received these vaccines have been followed for years because that's just not the timeline that we're working on. Um, and of course, the other thing, so nobody can say uh, that there are no long-term effects of the vaccines. We just don't have that data. Um, we know from previous vaccines that that's not something that typically develops with, with vaccines. Uh, and we also know that there are very severe acute and long-term effects of coronavirus and it's a virus that's not going away. So those are the things that you have to weigh when you're considering proceeding. If I could just add, um, not the technical stuff, which uh, Dr. Kirksey is going to be our expert this evening, uh, uh, but uh, the development of vaccines is hindered by the fact that vaccines are not profitable. Uh, and most of them, uh, like the ch ones that we all know about that are directed against childhood infections, you know, they just don't, they, they've been around for a long time and they're, they're not uh, a moneymaker for pharmaceutical companies. 
Uh, so the technology that was developed just was on the shelf, so to speak. And what happened with this vaccine was that the government basically protected the industry from financial losses. They pre-purchased hundreds of millions of doses. And it, this was before we knew that it worked. So they were basically saying, whether it works or not, uh, we are protecting you from financial losses. So the taxpayers um, said, this is so important that we will, uh, we will take on the risk. And then it is the, the technology is privately owned. Uh, and this is an issue right now in discussing um, how these vaccines will be made available to poor countries, for example. Uh, so those were the two things that really let it go so fast. One was that the technology had already been developed, which Dr. Kirksey has outlined, um, you know, for a little over a decade. The other, that the, the money was no object and was poured in um, public money for private, um, for a private, privately, you know, patented um, technology. Um, the other thing is that vaccinologists who I get to hang out with, uh, but I don't actually, I'm not one, say that usually the side effects emerge in the first six weeks, really bad things. Um, so obviously people were followed long enough. And all these were big trials. Some of them had 45,000 people in them. But now it's been given to millions and millions of people around the world. And I, and I think we all feel increasingly confident that these rare things that might have not turned up even with 45,000 people um, that, um, you know, aren't not, you know, that really horrible things aren't happening that, that were, are rare, but still we, we would feel worried about. Um, and the long-term effects, no vaccines, you know, do we know, you know, people say, well, it caused cancer or something. No vaccines that go on the market, do we follow that long uh, before they are approved for use? Um, we, you know, those very long-term effects are ones that we find out about uh, and uh, vaccines are really safe. That, that, that hasn't been shown. There've been terrible stories that have come out that have been refuted and I won't even repeat uh, about uh, some con consequences of vaccines. Uh, they're very safe by and large. Have I got that right, Dr. Kirksey? Is that, uh, Thank you both. I'm going to put like three questions before you now so you can kind of um, answer them as you'd like. We have a question about if the Johnson & Johnson vaccine also causes anaphylaxis. How likely is it that people will have to get a shot every year, like the flu shot due to the variants? What do we know about that? Um, you spoke to this a little bit, but another question about fertility. Do we have any, um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and then also a question about um, someone has heard, is it true that women have worse reactions to the second shot than men? Do you see anything like that? Uh, the first one, I think, is the, the easiest. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, yes, can also cause anaphylaxis. Um, most things can cause anaphylaxis, but the rates with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, seem to be even lower than those with Moderna uh, and Pfizer. I think they had, there were two cases in the initial trial, and then, of course, we'll have more data as it's being rolled out in the larger population, but it it's definitely doesn't seem to be any higher than with the other two vaccines. Um, the second question, I'm sorry. Um, are we gonna have to get this shot every year? What are oh, we gonna... right. Right. Do you wanna address that one, Mary? No, <laughs> <laughs> okay. we don't know yet. I mean, it, it's hard to believe, but we've really only known about this, you know, for a little over a year, the, the virus itself. So uh, we don't yet know a, a, a lot of things. We don't know whether people uh, will get infected, but not sick. Um, when they're vaccinated, and we don't know whether people's, how long people's uh, apparent immunity will last. I think that second one is is really the biggest issue. Yeah. Like I said, we're, we're starting to see people with some degree of waning immunity uh, to the actual virus. Yeah. Um, the vaccine, we expect to be more effective than the virus in uh, providing immunity. One, because of uh, all of the vaccines have uh, 
have ways of kind of hyper stimulating the immune response uh, even more than the natural virus would. But this virus, one of the reasons that it's so damaging uh, in people who do get sick is that it's also capable of tamping down the immune response. So part of the pathology of the virus is that it interferes with your body's ability to respond to the virus. Mm. And that's not something that happens with the vaccine. Um, so we do expect that the vaccine will probably have a more enduring effect. Um, but again, we don't know how long because we just don't know. Uh, and then the issue of the variants, um, it may be that there continue to be variants that are less uh, well targeted by the immune response to the vaccine. And so that you can very easily imagine a scenario where like the flu, as the virus uh, mutates, you have to tweak the vaccine a little bit to get a, a good immune response to it. And people have to get boosters every year and it just becomes part of our normal life going forward. Uh, but there's another thing that's kind of interesting if you wanna get really geeky about this. Um, two of the variants, the Brazilian and the South African variant have a mutation in a very specific spot on the uh, spike protein. And some of the other variants that are being detected now that we're starting to screen more in the United States, like the California, uh, I believe the California variant and uh, several others that have been detected also have mutations in this same spot. And so it seems like the virus may actually be developing kind of towards its peak potential for causing damage. And there are only, there are a limited number of places where it can mutate itself to become more transmissible um, and more virulent. And so it may be that once it exhausts those, we have one or two more um, vaccine tw uh, tweaks that we have to make to wow. get those couple of variants, but it may kind of run out of options over time. So that's mm -hmm. maybe the more optimistic uh, outcome that we that's might That's really interesting. So, so the fact that a similar mutation is coming up in very uh, independently, apparently, mm -hmm. suggests that there's like, it's sort of a, a, a one note song kind of, uh, the virus get just can change in, in a limited number of ways. And yeah, well, that's, that is encouraging. What about differences? Yeah. Is, is, can there anything be said about how um, someone responds? We have questions like, if you've had COVID, are you gonna respond one way? If you are male, if you are female, are we seeing any trends or anything that can be conducive about those types of things? I haven't seen any data on differences uh, in side effects for women and men um, in terms of those initial side effects after the vaccine. Younger patients tend to have uh, more of the side effects and tend to have a, a bit of a more robust immune response in general and are more likely to develop those side effects, but you see it across the age spectrum. Um, if you, there may be a signal, we may start, I, this is more anecdotal, but I am hearing that people who have had COVID before may also be more inclined to have a more intense response because in the first round, it, it's performing more like a booster. So like I said, the second shot of the vaccine, you're more likely to have uh, side effects in those first couple of days. People who've already had the virus, when they get their shot, it's, it's already like a second shot. So. So is it fair to say that the getting these side effects is sort of a sign that your immune system is is engaging with the vaccine? And um, a lot of people do say that. <laughs> yeah. the, um, again, if you want to get really granular about it, it seems like um, a lot of those early side effects are an actual response to the RNA itself, um, not as related to the specific immune response to the spike protein. Um, and it's been seen in other RNA uh, vaccine trials. We have a lot of questions about children. What are we, what are we thinking about children and vaccinations? Um, ages, have children been included in trials? Those types of things. And then um, if you could speak to, are the invitations online to join studies? Um, are those legitimate? Vaccine trial studies. And also a question about the Astra's Zenkia. Zeneca. Yeah, Zeneca. Yeah. Astra, I'm not going to try to say Zeneca. Z E N E C A, Zeneca. Okay, a question about that vaccine, what we know about it too, and then we'll go to Jackie. I see she's got one. Well, I, I don't think that the trials are out yet, are they? Uh, on, for children, they're anticipated. They're being enrolled. They're the one of them. I can't remember which one is was trialed in children down to the age of sixteen. Most of them eighteen and over. 
I, was it Pfizer that was 16 or Moderna was one of those? Moderna two. was 16. Yeah. Um, now they've started. And now they started with 12, 12. And then they're hoping that they'll get what are called sort of markers of immunity so that they can use, um, uh, not use getting sick um, as, uh, as uh, um, what they're looking for in, in the trials and be able to um, assess effectiveness of the vaccine in younger children without having to enroll such huge numbers. Uh, but we, the, the, the jury's still out and, and uh, the same is true with pregnant women, although the recommendation is that you talk to your doctor you know, it's worth thinking about the mechanisms of these vaccines and wh why we would think that they might be a problem for people. So that there was a question about fertility. And I think that that is sort of the answer for that. There, I can't think of any mechanism whereby this vaccine would affect a woman's fertility. So I actually had to, I, I looked this issue up because I was um, really surprised that it had come up as a concern. And, you know, I work in a hospital, obviously, and we had access really early and uh, found that a lot of, uh, especially the young nursing staff, were hesitant um, for this reason. And so um, there is, first, there's no evidence uh, that the vaccines affect fertility in any way or that there have been any issues in pregnancy or breastfeeding. Of course, talk to your physician about these concerns, uh, your personal concerns. But the question about fertility came up because there were two um, scientists of questionable repute who brought this up. They, they described um, a part of the spike protein, a very short region of uh, the spike protein that has some overlap with a molecule that's present on placentas. And there have been very many, very reputable scientists who have looked at this very closely and have said that there is no, um, there's no significant or even um, really noticeable overlap between the structures of this, uh, the spike protein and uh, the molecule that's on the placenta. You could imagine if you were vaccinating people against something that would make you create antibodies or an immune response to the placenta that that could cause a problem with fertility. Um, to me, besides the fact that there doesn't actually seem to be much similarity between uh, the, these two proteins, there's also no signal that uh, COVID itself, that the infection affects fertility. And you'll remember that the virus itself is covered in this same spike protein that you're developing an immune response uh, to with the vaccine. So if you were, if you were going to have a problem with uh, fertility in the vaccine, you'd expect to see a problem with the virus in the vaccine, and you're not uh, you're not seeing that either. Um, and again, mil many millions of people have been infected with this virus, and at this point, um, many millions have been vaccinated. They did not deliberately enroll pregnant women or women who were planning to be pregnant in the trials, but some women did become pregnant in uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer trials. Small numbers, not enough that you can say make any statistical conclusion, but there were no complications uh, for those patients in the trials. Um, the, coincidentally or not, the two problems that did happen uh, in patients in the Pfizer trial were in people who were in the control group who hadn't gotten the vaccine. So again, there, there are no signals that there's any actual concern here. As far as getting the vaccine during pregnancy, we know that COVID, uh, severe COVID during pregnancy can be catastrophic for both the mother and the child. Uh, in the United States, uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has recommended uh, vaccination for pregnant women and women who are breastfeeding. The WHO has recommended waiting uh, if you're not living in an area that doesn't that has a high burden of the virus. So you're really weighing a theoretical concern uh, where if you're not at risk of getting coronavirus, maybe wait to get the vaccine. But if you're in an area where it's still circulating at high levels like New York City, um, it's a theoretical risk from the vaccine versus a real risk from the virus that you're wearing. And again, you should be talking to your physician about this. Our final questions um, kind of coalesced around what can we expect? What's next? Is there, in your all's expertise, a hope of getting back to whatever next looks like, uh, not normal. We've all recognized that normal wasn't working, but what does this look like a year from now, two years from now, 
that and uh, talk a little bit about the global um, accessibility of um, the vaccines. We have some questions about, you know, has the US cornered some kind of market? What's access like in other countries? Um, and what are we hearing about the ones that are available there? Um, we'll end with those two before we pop to Jackie. Uh, well, why don't I say something about the global situation, which is really very worrying. Uh, they, um, the head of the World Health Organization has been, you know, sort of passionately advocating for, um, for the provision of this vaccine to all nations, because as we've learned from uh, this virus that it went from one country to every country um, on, on earth and uh, in just a few months, it, it, if we have COVID-19 anywhere in the world, uh, it places all of us at risk. But, um, but there are many countries that have had no vaccine and don't expect to see it until 2022. And uh, there also are uh, countries that pre-ordered vast quantities of the vaccine in excess of their population. Uh, Canada, for example, is said to have bought four times as much vaccine uh, than they need to vaccinate their population. So this is the source of many conversations. Uh, there's something going on at the World Trade Organization, uh, which is unlikely to succeed, but at least it's been raised that the intellectual property should be licensed to other manufacturers so that these vaccines uh, can be made uh, in other parts of the world. In many ways, this situation has analogies to antiretroviral drugs, which proved to be life-saving for people living with HIV. So there are real issues. Um, and we shouldn't just think of them as issues that are about being decent to poor countries. This really is about protecting all of us. Um, a plane ride away is all that it takes for a virus to be reintroduced and it will keep mutating. I hope that Dr. Kirksey's uh, um, you know, a hypothesis that the repertoire will be limited and a, a, an, an enduringly protective vaccine will be, um, will be possible, but it's always possible that a mutation could evade the vaccine and that would be a, a tragedy of mammoth proportions. <laughs> and there was another question too that I thought was, wasn't there another question? Uh, um. I think it was, yeah, mostly about, people are asking about the global implications of this okay. and accessibility might happen. Um, and also um, just what what we might see, you know, two years from now, like her. Right. Oh, right, where, where are we gonna get our lives back? Which is yeah. what we all want. You know, I, I'm, I, I, it's gonna take longer than we'd like, <laughs> I'm afraid. And, um, and we all have to stay the course. We, you know, um, so I, you know, I, I don't know um, uh, how, lo how long it will take. Certainly the vaccine will help us get there. Do you have any better productions than that? <laughs> um, I think things are going to look much better very soon. But like I, I said briefly earlier, I don't think this virus is, is going anywhere. I mean, they're large parts of this country. There are a significant number of people who are, who are going to opt not to get vaccinated. Um, there are some people who are not going to be able to get vaccinated for various reasons. And there are large parts of the world that don't have any access. So I think we're going to have this virus circulating in some form for quite a while. Um, and there will be something of a, a new normal. Um, and if that just means that everybody is washing their hands, then I'm going to call it a win. <laughs> and covering their mouths when they cough, uh, then then I think that's kind of our, our best case scenario. Jackie, as a clergy woman, where's your head right now? Are you going to get vaccinated? Have you been vaccinated? What are you I thinking? Got my first shot last week, and I get my second shot on uh, March 29. It was a very moving experience. It was a very powerful experience. Amanda and I talked about how we felt like it almost felt like 
a holy religious experience to watch everybody in the Javis Fenter with their masks. I only saw one person with their nose out, everybody wearing a well-fitted mask, everybody keeping their distance, everybody acting like we are now being a community, an Ubuntu community, and we're taking care of each other, we are related to each other. That just moved me deeply. Um, so that's my, that's my jam about that, Amanda. How about you? Same, absolutely. I got my first shot and I felt deep gratitude to all of the people who have been working um, to get us to this place for a year now and feel like um, it's important um, for people to know that as soon as you can get it, um, get it. If, and if you have questions about that, reach out to someone um, here at Middle Church. Uh, we are set up to help people secure appointments. Megan's gotten appointments for people in our congregation. Drew's gotten appointments for people in our congregation. We can help you get a ride there. Uh, we have a, a website, middlechurch.org slash vaccinate, and we post updates there. Um, a lot of them are New York specific, but not all of them. Um, and, it, and it can help you. There's also job opportunities there if you want to uh, work the Javits Center or somewhere else to um, be able to get vaccinated sooner, you can. Um, there's on-call lists if you're not eligible yet that you can sign up for, um, all kinds of resources there. And um, Jackie and I both feel like this is one of the best ways that we can be in the center of our mission and vision at Middle Church, which is to love God and love neighbor and love ourselves. And love ourselves. Yeah. Amen, amen, Amanda. And one of the things that I was, uh, you know, sidebarring with Megan about is um, she's going to check on copyright issues about the slides that she has, but she's going to share with us what she can share, and we will put those up at the website as well, so that you can point your relatives, your friends, your uh, family to that. Um, I think I wanted to just close by by saying. And, and we're all able to help each other be, be better. When Megan makes her best case scenario, well, well, if we're just only coughing and covering our mouth and washing our hands, amen. But every single day, we get to make a choice about wearing our masks well. Every single day, we get to make a choice about washing our hands, about socially distancing, about even though we love each other, to respect the vulnerable people in our families, you know, our young people and our older people, old people like me, um, to, to, to just take care and to take care of yourself, to rest, to sleep, to, to, to act like your body is part of immunology, is what's in my mind. You are part of this, the solution. So just praying for you to be well, um, wanting you to know that Amanda and Daryl and I care about this middle community. And because you came tonight, that means you're part of it. So we hope that you'll uh, stay in touch and, and stay safe and stay well with so much gratitude for Dr. Bassett and Dr. Kirksey, for Megan and Mary's just brilliant presentation. Uh, we're just thrilled that you came. Thank you. I'm mute. Thank you, Amanda. Me. We're pulling it together. It's good to see you, grandparents you so of the beautiful babies. <laughs> Kirksey's, it's good to see you. Thank you. Mary, thank you. So nice to meet you. Oh, it was Appreciate a real pleasure. You. And it was a real pleasure, Dr. Kirksey, to meet you. It has you. been. Thank I, you very much. I haven't heard such a lucid description of things before, actually. So that was great. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Blessings to everybody. Of Have a great night, everyone. Wellness. Thank, Thank you, Megan. So Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. It's wonderful to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Matlin. <laughs>